Okay, who, who clapped like three quarters of the way through that song? Anybody? You got some clapping in there, all right? How many of you clapped on beat for even the first part? <laughs> There's probably some of those, because everybody does that a little bit. I love that song, man. What joy. What a great song to finish on. That our God does bring such great joy that he's overcome death and the enemy. That's one of the things we're talking about today is, is victory. Uh, and a great thing is I, wanted, I just want to recognize, I don't know if you guys know this, but Southwest Covenant boys just played in the state uh, this week on Friday. They played Frontier, which is awesome. And uh, man, what something to be proud of. But also the guys who were in there, they played the number one team in the state. And it started out, in, and I'll, I'll say this to the guys sitting here, it looked like it was going to be bad, guys. It looked like it was going to be really, really bad. At the first, it was like 19 to 3. And then they stormed back because those guys had such character and such fight. And so it was a real joy to watch our guys fight for that type of, type of victory, you know. And I was joking with the people sitting there that, you know, what would it be for me to get kicked out, go down there and yell at the ref? Because there's always that guy that's screaming and yelling. Uh, you know, I was at my son's game, and I promise this has a point. I was at my son's game, and I wasn't really that emotionally invested at first. Sorry, Trip. I just, it, I wanted him to win, but I didn't care that much. But then there was this guy who sat next to me, and you've probably had this happen to you at a game. And the, before, the game just started, and the guy just starts going off about fouls, and I'm, they just had the tip. And in the whole game, he was just complaining. And inside of me, I started kind of like, I don't really care that much if we win, but as soon as that guy started going, it, something flipped inside of me, and it was like, we're going to win this game. we got to overcome this guy. There was a foul, and the guy ran out on the court. And my dad, who might watch this, actually told him, get back off the court. It was like old times when I was growing up. Dad yelling. All that to say, we all want victory. We all want victory. In our life. We all desire it. We long for it. We fight for it. We fight for it in you know, our families. We fight for victory in our families to be the best possible parent that we can be be the best dad that we can be. We fight for it at work. If you're a man, you want to get that position where people will recognize you or you'll get that, that, the money that you feel like you need to provide for your family, we fight for it there. We fight for our mental health. Sometimes we look in the mirror and we don't like what we see and we just want to fight for the, the day when we can look in the mirror and we can like what we see. We're all fighting for something. We all want victory in our lives, emotionally, in our place of work, our school, wherever. But one of the things that's been kind of interesting of being a pastor now for 10 years-ish is how few of us really care if we have victory in the spiritual realm. We'll fight for victory in a lot of other areas, and we'll set goals and plans and all kinds of things. But when it comes to the spiritual life, we just kind of go willy-nilly and just hope that it happens. And we hope that we'll have victory. But what would it look like for us to be victorious in the Christian life? What would that look like? And how could we strive today, if, if I said today, I want you to be victorious in the Christian life, what would that look like? And we have a lot of different answers, but one of the things we're going to do today is we're going to go to the Word of God. 1 John 5, 1 through 5. Because the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. I learned that yesterday at men's breakfast, if you weren't there. I already knew it, but sometimes we have to be reminded more than instructed, right? Some of this stuff this morning will probably not be new to you, but... Um, like I said, sometimes we have to be reminded more than we are instructed. So th this is where John, he's writing this book to people who've kind of bailed out on the church uh, because of all these different things going on. And he's reminding these guys, what, is true, what does true life look like? What's true love look like? What does it look to live an ob obedient Christian life? And he's at the final chapter of this book. And he's going to sum it all up. And I'm just going to walk through this passage with you. And I'm going to pray before we start that the Holy Spirit would open your eyes and your ears and your heart to something new this morning that maybe you've heard before, but now you would hear it afresh. So, Father, would you come and speak through me? And um, I know that I don't bring anything in myself, but I know that your Holy Spirit is alive and active in me. And so would you speak through me to the hearts of people to transform them not, so that we leave here differently? God, we know that your word is the sword of the spirit, and so we pray that you would cut between soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and you would do a work this morning in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's start reading. 
Okay? 1 John 5, 1 says this. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. How important is it to know where you come from? Very important. You know, they have all these 23andMe, Ancestry.com, and all these different things. Because they actually found that studies say that if you actually know your family history, like you're 70% more likely to be able to deal with the challenges that you face in this life. I used to work at a group home called Heartlight Ministries. Kids who were taken out of their home. That was where God, I did the first ministry I ever did. Two-thirds of the kids that came into that ministry who had to be removed from their home came from adopted families. They were struggling with where were they born? How was I born? It mattered to them. Do we know where we've been born? Some of us have great parents. Some of us don't. But the great thing about God is he gives us a fresh start. Whether our lives have been great, we enjoy our parents, we enjoy where we've been born. And even if you don't know a father, and our father lives in our country, even if you don't know your father, we, it's good to know that we can be born of God. To have a fresh start with God himself. And how do we have this being born and know who, where we came from? It says everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ. What does it mean to believe that Jesus is the Christ? Don't, doesn't it say in James that the demons believe in God and they shudder? Isn't it when Jesus is calling out the demons, they say, I know who you are, Jesus. Do you remember those stories? So what's the difference? Are, are, are demons children of God? What does this belief mean? Because we've all known people who will say, yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I believe in Jesus. But it doesn't seem like to jive with you at all in your soul and your spirit. Have you ever met someone like that? So what does this believing mean? You know, there's this guy named John Patron. I probably got his name all wrong, and I'll probably get the next name wrong too, but it doesn't matter because this is the story. This guy named John uh, Patron back in the 1800s decided that he was going to go share Jesus with these people of the New Hebrides. This, I don't know where that is, but it's somewhere where there's native people. And when he gets there, there's a language barrier between the two. And he can't, he can't uh, find the word for belief. And so it's hard to tell people about Jesus to believe in him if there's no word for that. And so one day he gets this idea. He says, when he walks in, uh, the natives walk into the room, he gets, leans back on his chair and he, and he goes completely on it and says, what am I doing right now? And they gave him a word. And from then on, he took that word and he used it. It means to lean all of oneself onto something. And that's what this idea of believing that Jesus is the Christ, it means to, to lean all of one's weight on to this, Jesus is the Christ. He's not just some man that lived 2,000 years ago. He is the Christ. He's the anointed one, the one who came to pay for the penalty of all of our sins. I want to ask you a question. Is all of your life right now leaning on Christ? Or is your life leaning on success at work? Success at family? Are those things more important? Is your whole weight of your life being leaned on Christ? Because that's what it means to believe. It means everything in you is leaning on who Christ is. That he is Christ, he's the son of God. And when you do that, when you do that for the first time, you are born of God. Make sense? And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. It says when you, one of the things that we get victory is, one, we have to know who God is. Second, if we want to get victory, we have to love what God loves. It's, it's like, you know, you could say you love me, but if you say my son is a jerk, which you wouldn't, right? But if you did... You wouldn't love me, right? You'd say, I, I love you, but I don't like your wife at all. No, we're a package deal, man. If you love me, the best way to love me is to care for my family. And God's saying the same thing in this passage. He's saying, if you want to love the Father, then love those who've been born of him. Which is interesting in this world. So many people nowadays, especially younger people, say, oh, I love God, but I don't want to have much to do with the church. Or, I love God, and I'll come to church but I don't really want to be around people. I just want to come and I want to go. And it's, it's really between me and God, which is interesting because Adam was, he and God in the garden was perfect and it still wasn't good enough. So why do we tend to think that it's just, if it's good between me and God, I don't need anybody else. I disregard his, his children. 
And loving his children is hard, right? People are annoying, right? It's true. I'm annoying. You're probably saying that right now, right? It's hard to love people sometimes, you know? But this is the idea in the Bible, is that love is not an abstraction. It has teeth to it. In Hebrew, in Hebrew when, in the Old Testament, when they talked about God's love, they always told about what God actually did. Like the acts that he performed, how he rescued people. Love is not an abstraction, but you know the interesting thing for us is we say we love all kinds of things. We can sit and hear a great message from Clarence Hill, case in point, and say, oh, I, I love racial reconciliation, and then do nothing with it. That's just an abstract thought, right? Why, is, why are people enslaved to, to politics right now? And uh, I'm probably going in deep ground here, but it's because you can love an abstraction. You can, you can love with, it says earlier in, in 1 John 3, let us not love with words and tongue, but action and truth. We could probably say it today, let us not love with um, words and a keyboard, but action and truth. Because so many of us want to love an abstraction. We'll, we'll vote maybe two times, but we don't really care about the actual issue. We don't actually do anything about it. We just keep it out there with all the right thoughts in our head. But that's not love. That's, that's, that's really weak. And so here's the deal. Sometimes we say, yeah, Zach, I'd like to love these people, but I just can't do it. Like, I, don't, I hear this all the time. I'd, I'd love to do that, but God's never given me the talent to do that. I don't have the patience for that. I don't have the gifts to do that. I don't have the ability to, to love like that. I'll tell you another story. One time there was this little girl, and she went to her father and said, I'm having trouble doing what God's asking me to do. And, and the dad said to the little girl, hey, do you know when you go out into the countryside, this is in England, you go out into the countryside to stay with your relatives and you ride the train? She goes, yeah. He said, when do I give you the tickets? Do I give them to you two weeks before, or do I give them to you when you're ready to get on the train? And she said, when I get on the train, he says, so it is with God. Sometimes he doesn't give us all the things we need two weeks before. Sometimes we actually have to start doing what we know, and then God gives us the ability to do those things. If I would have waited for God to tell me, uh, you're, you'd be good at being a pastor, I never would have done it. I actually had to lead a Bible study with those, those youth at Heartlight Ministries who didn't want anything to do with God. I had to start leading Bible studies there when I thought I had nothing to offer, and then God used it, and it snowballed to the point where I'm standing up here, which is still crazy. But he didn't tell me two weeks before. He told me when I started doing it, and then he kept giving me skill and skill and skill on top of that. So when you, when you say, I can't do it, Right, you can do it, because God has not given you the ability right now, but he will when you're obedient to what he's called you to do. Does that make sense? I got a couple head nods. That's good enough for me. <laughs> <clears throat> and then by this, we know that we love, uh, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we obey God, when we love God and we obey his commandments. It's like a cycle. If you want to love people, then love God. If you want to love God, then love people. And if you wonder why your faith is stagnant, maybe you're not loving people, or maybe you're loving people real well, but you're not really loving God really well. So you might take a look at that little cycle and see where you are. For this is the love, love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So if we want to love God, then we do what he says. We don't think about it. We don't actually ponder it. We don't do a 15-week study on what God has said. We actually do what he's asked us to do. If we love him, we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Don't they feel burdensome sometimes though? For the young single guy, the call to sexual purity seems really burdensome, does it not? When you're financially strapped and you hear about God's generosity, that seems like a burden, does it not? Sometimes they feel kind of burdensome and we, sh we wish we could just throw them off and be set free of them? How do we carry these commands and them not be burdensome? Well, I'll tell you, I'm great at stories, so I'm gonna tell you another one. I don't know if I'm great. You can be the judge of that. I shouldn't judge that. My girls love to, to play piggyback. 
Like they love to carry one another and pick each other up all the time. And one, they can't do it. They can't physically do it. So if I put a twin on the other twin, they both crumble to the ground, right? It doesn't work like that. They just, they can't bear that weight, so they just... One of the things they love to do is that I'll pick one up and sit one on the back of the other, bearing a lot of the, little bit of the weight and for sure steadying them. And then the one on the bottom feels like they're actually carrying the other twin and they have a great time when really reality, if I let go of them, they would just humble, just go into a, just a pile of red curly hair. That's what our <laughs> twins would be, right? But the same is true of God. Sometimes, you know, we have these, bur- we have these commands to follow. But we don't do it alone. It's just not us and the commands. It's the Holy Spirit. You know, when God ascended to heaven, he promised that he'd send his Holy Spirit to be a helper and a guide and a seal. And so to, to carry those commands, if we are not having the Holy Spirit steady us, hold us, live through us, do those things, we cannot bear those things. We don't have the willpower to carry all those commands apart from the Holy Spirit. He has to be with us. He has to empower us to do it. We need him desperately. We didn't just need him for salvation. We need him today to do the things that he's calling us to do today. That's why the gospel still matters. The Holy Spirit is still here. We still need him every single day to carry us through. Which is interesting, and this is just another social commentary about us is that we sometimes will put all of the burden for everybody to live like we live. Have our sexual ethics, have our ideas about this. The world needs all these particular things. But if we do not tell them about the power of the Holy Spirit, they cannot bear the weight of all of those commands that we're telling them to live. And you wonder why the world would kick against us. They don't have the power source to carry it. So if you don't tell them about Christ and the Holy Spirit, then you're just putting a burden on people that they could never bear. They have to know that that the Holy Spirit is the one who is our power source to live these things out. How can Jesus say my yoke is easy and my burden is light? Because the Holy Spirit does the lifting. So if you're trying to live apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, it does feel pretty weighty. And you need the Holy Spirit. So his commands are not burdensome if you're doing a three-person piggyback move with the Holy Spirit, which is a weird way to think about it. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes or conquers the world, has victory over the world. You know, there's three things that fight against us. I learned this in a study I'm in. Some of you are in it too, 2-7. There's really three things that fight against us. It's the world, our flesh, and the devil. And those three things sometimes just feel like they weighed us down, Right? If your body's ever been failing, you understand what it's like for your flesh to feel completely, your body just feels physically weak. You know what it's like, this this world has got a totally different system. And he even goes on later in this chapter to say that the the enemy is the one that has the power over this world. And the devil is working for our destruction every single day. And if we're gonna have victory, we need to know who our enemy is. And it's the world, it's the devil, it's our flesh. But anyone who's been born of God overcomes, conquers, The world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. This is what overcomes the world, our faith. Do you ever feel like you're just beat down by the world? Do you ever feel like your flesh is completely weak to do the things that God's called you to do? Do you ever feel like the enemy is just attacking? Do you ever doubt sometimes... That, like, is this really real? Do you ever feel just completely overwhelmed where it just feels completely dark? You know all these truths, but in your heart, you're just not feeling any of it at the moment? It's kind of like that psalm I read earlier. Those guys knew about God. They'd heard of his fame. They stood in awe of his deeds, yet right now they didn't experience it all. They were in a dark, dark place. So what overcomes that? Faith. Faith. And faith is not is the opposite of doubt, but the opposite of doubt is not certainty. What a lot of people want in order to act is certainty, but he doesn't give us certainty, he gives us faith. And faith is just believing. Mark Batterson, the one of the guy I really respect, says, What is faith? Faith is taking one step when you don't know where the second will be. 
when you don't know if it just feels so dark right now, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to take a step towards God, not knowing where the second step will be. Another guy puts it like this. Faith is the bird that sings when the dawn is still dark. I'm going to read that again. I love this one. Faith is the bird that sings when the dawn is still dark. It's a bird that knows the sun is coming, but right now it's completely dark and they're still going to sing. Maybe you have never been in a place where it feels like, I know all this stuff is real, I know the sun's coming, but I'm so, it's so dark right now, I don't know what to do, my, my health is failing me, my kids have gone off and done all these different things, I just can't carry this anymore. But faith is the bird that sings when the dawn is still dark. And says, no, I'm going to trust these things and I'm going to act on them. That's how we overcome the world. Not when we have complete certainty, when we act on what we know. And this, I say this all the time, and I'll say it again. We are, are educated way, 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 way beyond our obedience level. Faith is acting when it's dark. When you don't know where the second step is going to come, you still act. And that's what overcomes the world. But many of us are not living a life of faith. We're just living a life of certainty. And I know this, so I'm going to stick to this. But that's not the life that we're intended to live. And who is that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? What's this belief in? What's this faith in? It's the belief that Jesus is the Son of God. I'll be honest, I'll just, personal confession time. So there's no confession, but I'm going to tell you. You know, I struggle. There's times I struggle with doubt. You know, I wrestle with really hard questions sometimes, and I struggle with doubt. I listen to podcast, uh, a podcast called Hinge, and it was telling me it was about the story of this guy this week who um, he, his, his mentor, his youth pastor died, and his grandfather was really, really sick, and he was in a dark, dark place. And he said one night he just decided to get really, really drunk with a group of people. And he got so drunk that they all passed out. And he said he took a bottle of vodka and he went and he sat on the beach and he said, God, show me that you're real. And he said, at first I was hoping that dolphins would jump out and spell God is real, you know. And that didn't happen. And then he said it went on. And then by the end of the night, he said, I would have taken a homeless man relieving himself as a sign. None of it ever came. And he threw in the towel. And he, he said, enough with it. Now he's an atheist. But I, there's been times, and I say this, that there's times that I've wrestled and say, God, are you real? And if you're honest, every one of you has probably felt that at some point. Are you real? But there's one thing I cling to when I, there's a lot of things that frustrate me and cause me to doubt. It's this. It's the life of Jesus Christ. That his life is attested to 2,000 years ago that he came that he lived, that he died, that he was resurrected again, that his disciples would be willing to die for the fact it's not a lie. He rose again, and if he rose again, he could conquer death, and he could defeat death, and he could give us this eternal life that he talked about. I place all of my life on, on who Jesus said he was and what he accomplished 2,000 years ago. And you can study the history. All this other stuff I get confused about, and sometimes I doubt a lot of times I don't, but sometimes I do, but I always go back to what do I place my faith in? The man of Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life on my behalf, who rose again, who conquered death, who said he was going to send his Holy Spirit. And if he conquered death, then he did send his Holy Spirit, then I can count on that. And my whole faith is built on that construct. All of my life is leaned back on the chair that Jesus is who he says he is when there's a lot of doubt. But I've, I, but I've been conquering the world because the Holy Spirit's been alive in me and he's active and he teaches me. So what am I asking you to do this morning? Do you want victory in your spiritual life? I come back to where I started. Do you want victory in your spiritual life? Do you have any aspirations in your spiritual life? Or are they all out there in some other realm? John is telling these people, you want victory then place all of your faith and all of your life and all the weight of your life on who Jesus says he is and what he did all those years ago. 
And if you do that and you continue to walk in that, even when you don't know a lot of the other questions, you take one step, not knowing where the second will be, and then you get there and you say, I'm going to place my life in Jesus once again, and I'm going to go forward. And God will come. Sometimes the dark does, you know, the darkness subsides and there's light and there's victory and it makes sense. And sometimes we can come in here and celebrate because God's made himself so real. Does that make sense? I hope so. Because I know that apart from Jesus Christ in my life, apart from my, my life leaning on him, if I turn on the news, I'd be overwhelmed. When I yell at my kids when I shouldn't, I'd be overwhelmed. Because I cannot do the things that I need to do in this life. I can't even be the man I want to be. I can't even control my tongue for one day apart from Jesus. So my life is placed in him. And I'm asking you, I'm imploring you, if you've never met Jesus and you're trying to live it in your own power and you feel the crushing weight of all these rules that even the church sometimes places on you, but you haven't had the Holy Spirit because you haven't trusted in Jesus, I'm asking you today, I'm imploring you, come to Christ. Come place all of your life in his death, burial, and resurrection so that you can understand the freedom that comes from that. That when all, all else is questionable, you can know that you can know in your heart of hearts that Jesus is real and he's alive. Make sense? Let me pray for you. If you're one of those people that wants to come, wants to, to know who God is, you want to know God like I know God, then I'd love to talk to you about that. I don't promise you my life, I'm not trying to make it beautiful in front of you. So my life is not beautiful, but my Savior is beautiful, and I'd love to talk to you about Him. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we just come to you today, and we just thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you that when we believe in you, we become children of God. We're not orphans. No, we're sons of the King. And sometimes I get confused. But God, I thank you for your life that could be attested to in history. And it's a fact. And I can trust in it. And God, I thank you that even though you created the universe, the galaxies, the stars, and all of that, yet you condescended and came to us. Which I can't, I can't fathom that. But you came for us. And because you did that, I'm going to place my life at your feet. And I pray if there's anyone else in here who wants to place their life at your feet this morning, God, in their, their heart and their soul, they'd be crying out, Jesus, save me. Save me. Give me your Holy Spirit. Give me this new life that you talk about. Because I know what the enemy's trying to do in this world. I know it's trying to destroy me, and I feel destroyed. But I want my life to be found in you. God, I pray for the believers in here, the, those who know this, that were reminded more than instructed. God, would you give them spiritual goals? That they would lean deeper, deeper into the chair of your life. And that they would quit putting their trust in other things to be their joy and their happiness, but that they would put all of their hope on you. And that we would sense the joy of being your son or daughter. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.